now the Pacific Northwest is ground zero around fossil fuel exports, and there's even talk about tar sands, um, a la the Kingstone pipeline through Washington State. So hmm. uh, it's just an incredibly important time for people to just speak up and say, this makes no sense for our local environment. It is catastrophic in terms of climate impacts. Um, it's threatening to the region's reputation as a sustainability leader. Um, we're supposed to be a state that's known for its sustainability, and we're going to be the first state that has a state agency giving away publicly owned water so that Nestle can profit and sell, profit off of it. I mean, that's criminal. Mm -hmm. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today we have two guests. We have uh, Bethany Cotton, who is with Greenpeace USA, and she's also a board member of FLOW, and we'll let uh, Bethany tell us what FLOW is in a moment. Uh, our other guest is Julia DeGraw. Uh, Julia's been on uh, the show at least a couple of times. Yep. Right? Okay. And she is with uh, Food and Water Watch uh, here in Portland. So uh, both welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having us. Good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So what we want to talk about today uh, is LNG and a little bit about Nestle uh, and Cascade Lock and uh, this whole question about exporting our natural resources. So uh, I guess we'll start with you, Be uh, Bethany. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, what does FLOW stand for? Well, FLOW is an organization that's all volunteer based called Friends of Living Oregon Waters that works specifically to protect waterways in the state of Oregon. Okay. And, and they're primarily in Southern Oregon? Is that based right? in Southern Oregon, mm -hmm. um, but I'm based here in Portland, so we're, there are representatives around the state. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Great. Good. So uh, th there are a, a, a number of uh, liquefied natural gas mm -hmm. pipeline proposals. Right. Uh, with the purpose of exporting the natural gases that we produce here in the United States. So can you just talk about some of those uh, proposed pipelines? Sure. So it, we're in an interesting situation in the Pacific Northwest. We have this reputation as the most sustainable region in the country and as kind of a green economy leader. And But right now we are facing an absolute onslaught of uh, proposals to export fossil fuels uh, through the region. Um, and the first kind of iteration of this started to bubble up about eight, nine years ago now um, around liquefied natural gas. And those proposals initially were to import gas, uh, and they were touted as a way to make sure that we had relatively inexpensive and um, in the industry's estimation relatively clean source of um, fuel. And in the course of the last eight years, those proposals have been completely flipped on their heads and have now become export proposals. And for about the last four years, we thought that was probably what was going mm -hmm. on. And, and for a long time, um, the industry said that we were crazy and conspiracy theorists. And, and then about a little over a year ago, they said, well, I think that the quote in the Oregonian was, the folks working on LNG can now take off their tinfoil hats because all those suspicions have been confirmed, and, mm -hmm. and now these proposals are to export. Um, and it really is a result of, of fracking, um, and which really goes against this idea that natural gas is actually a clean fuel, or even a bridge fuel to get us past reliance on coal and oil. And I think Julia can speak a little bit to the efforts to, to work on fracking, and, and there's been sort of a, a disconnect between the fracking that is primarily happening on the East Coast, although it's happening a lot now in Wyoming, and there are proposals even in Eastern Oregon um, to really put that together with this fight about LNG and that they really are the same fight. Um, and so it's not just proposal or pipelines, it's also the export terminals. Um, and we have two large proposals in Oregon. Um, one is the Jordan Cove liquefied natural gas proposal in Coos Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is associated with the Pacific Connector Pipeline proposal. So the pipeline um, is proposed 234 mile long pipeline um, from Malin, Oregon, which is where there's a current hub with existing pipelines. Okay. And, and whereabouts is Malin? Malin is in southeastern Oregon, um, just a little north of the California border, small town. Uh, but a hub for natural gas. And um, that pipeline would snake then through um, four counties in southern Oregon to Coos Bay through some of the last um, remaining habitat for spotted owls, um, some very remote areas, very steep um, areas of the state where there's a lot of concern about forest fire risk um, and very little emergency response capacity. There are actually 
30 listed um, threatened and endangered species in the path of that mm -hmm. pipeline. So um, spotted owls are just the most famous of those. Spotted owl is the most famous. Um, marbled murrelet, salmon, euchelon, green sturgeon, um, all sorts of different species that are right in the path of that pipeline. Um, it's a really, really terrible idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are lots of reasons to be concerned. And then that, that terminal would be in Coos Bay, which is in a tsunami inundation zone. Uh, not particularly stable spot to mm -hmm. put um, tanks of an extremely flammable um, liquid or gas, depending on what state it's in. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a proposal that's been around for quite a while. Again, it initially was an import proposal and now has flipped to export. And they had received um, some permits from various counties and also initial permitting from um, and a license from FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that oversees natural gas. Um, and those permits have been pulled because of the flip from import to export. Oh, and so, so they're they, back um, in the permitting process. Oh, okay. Again. So they have to re get re They do. They, ho okay. they had hoped not to have to do that. Uh -huh. um, and, and the... Luckily, um, and rightly, the federal government said, no, you, you have to start over. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are with that proposal. Um, and that would be over a billion um, square feet, cubic square feet a day, which is a lot of gas yeah. flowing through And it. so the, uh, the, the gas uh, is produced now primarily through the fracking process. Yep, more and more. Okay. Yep, much a less a conventional and, and gas. Then, and then it goes through the pipelines as, as a gas. Mm -hmm. until it gets to the terminal right. and, then it's, and then it's liquefied. Right, So that and that is a very energy intensive process. Uh, and there's actually an associated proposal to build a 350 megawatt um, gas power plant there to fuel, provide the energy to liquefy the gas and store it in tanks and then load it onto ships to be shipped abroad. Um, and that takes the carbon footprint of natural gas um, up to being on par with oil. And a lot of the argument is, oh, it's much less carbon footprint, it's cleaner, it burns better, um, there aren't as many environmental consequences to using natural gas. And that's just not true mm -hmm. anymore when we're talking about fracking. And, and that doesn't even get to methane. the issues of <laughs> methane and contamination yeah. of water supplies um, that I think Julia can speak to yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Why, why, why don't we talk about that fracking process a little bit and talk about some of the environmental problems with that? Yes, so, so Food and Water Watch um, is one of the uh, lead national groups in leading a fight for a ban on fracking. Um, we don't believe, um, well, that's actually the wrong word, there is no <laughs> safe way to, to frack. Um, and what the process actually is, is uh, sometimes natural gas formations occur underneath shale rock formations. So in order to access them, you have to you know, drill through the earth and through these shale, gr shale um, rock formations in order to get to the natural gas. In order to do that, you use billions of gallons of water, uh, lots of chemicals um, that are hard to pronounce <laughs> and are known carcinogens and, um, and are really you know, bad for the environment and ruin drinking water. Um, but furthermore, once you use all these chemicals to drill through the shale um, and to access the natural gas and you start pumping that out, the, the pipes that you're pumping that natural gas through um, eventually fail. It's kind of inevitable that eventually the casings around these will fail. They're concrete casings. Uh, it's just a matter of time. And when they do, then you get natural gas itself seeping into aquifers that you know you had to drill through in order to get to the natural gas. And this is how people famously, as you could see in a lot of news shows and in the movie Gasland, people are lighting their drinking water on fire. Mm -hmm. In uh, Colorado, that's um, just a coincidence. Th those things happen anyway, right? Well, and actually, there was another really great follow-up movie um, that Josh Fox did uh, th to respond to the industry's claim that this is naturally occurring natural gas that's infiltrating into people's drinking water. Um, and, and and the example they'll use is that the kind of gas that's under the shale formation is different than the kind of gas that's um, above it, hmm. and you can tell that by looking at the chemical analysis of it. And they're saying, well, that's not the gas we were drilling for, so it's not our fault. It totally, those industry leaders who are saying that and they're, they're, um, they're paid off scientists are, are ignoring the fact that the pipe goes all the way through every single layer. So the natural gas can seep into that um, groundwater system at any layer. So even though it's not the natural gas they were drilling for, it's still infiltrating drinking water systems because of the drilling that they have done. Um, and uh, 
and it's literally ruined the drinking water for, for thousands of people. And Colorado is heavily fracked. Um, uh, and Texas is seeing a lot of fracking, and there's a lot of pipelines going through Texas that have major problems as well. And Wyoming is, is doing a lot of fracking on, on publicly owned land, which is, in my opinion, criminal. So, mm -hmm. well, so that's our, our way of looking at it, is we're working on LNG in Oregon because the only reason why we're trying to export natural gas is because of the supposed glut in the market, which wouldn't exist if it weren't for this incredibly dangerous um, practice of fracking. Mm -hmm. And there's really interesting, broad opposition to the idea of exporting natural gas. Some, some allies that we as conservation organizations are not necessarily used to having um, from industrial gas users because there's very clear analysis that the cost of natural gas domestically will go up um, at really surprisingly high rates. Uh, we could see a 50% jump in natural gas rates, not just um, for industrial users, but also for, for domestic users. So it's, it's going to cost you more to have your gas stove. And, and if you're like me, I have, I have a preference. I like cooking on my gas stove mm -hmm. uh, a little better than electrical. But um, so it's really interesting because Dow Chemical, for example, is very concerned about uh, th these proposals to export natural gas because they know it will increase their production costs. Um, and there's real concern about how that will impact manufacturers and, and a lot in Oregon um, for food producers, yeah. um, for folks who are growing using, um, you know, you got hothouse tomatoes, you have mm. to keep that hothouse warm enough, um, especially during the cooler months, and to do that, most of them use natural gas. Uh, and so there's real concern across the board, not just from conservationists and public health advocates, but also from um, the industry in this country about those impacts. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the Southern Oregon Project, uh, which is terrible. And then there's also one now in Northern Oregon, and I think folks um, who followed this a little bit will, will probably say, well, didn't we beat that one back? And, and there were actually originally two in Northern Oregon on the Columbia. There was the Bradwood Landing proposal and Oregon LNG. Um, an interestingly named project, and Bradwood Landing um, is gone, and that company went bankrupt and left a whole lot of creditors, including um, local governments and, and um, a whole lot of folks uh, with big bills, uh, because until the day before they went bankrupt, they were full steam ahead on their plans to turn Bradwood Landing on the Columbia, which is really important salmon habitat, into this fossil fuel exporting location. Um, so Bradwood Landing is gone, but Oregon LNG has sort of come back from the dead, and we're seeing them again. And that proposal is in Warrington, out near Astoria, okay. um, on the so Columbia. Right by, right where the Columbia joins into, flows into the ocean. Yeah, pretty close right. to that. It's a little upstream mm -hmm. um, of the confluence, right, of the Pacific and, and Columbia, which, you know, it's important to note that's one of the most dangerous bars in the world. Mm -hmm. So sending a tanker full of flammable liquid might not be the best idea. Mm -hmm. um, the blast radius for LNG tankers is frighteningly large, um, and the ability to put out a fire um, burning on liquefied natural gas is, is exceptionally difficult. So there's a lot of concern about that. Um, and, and just the vessel traffic is a huge impact. But um, but the, the idea that these tankers would come in, and, and one reason why the federal government said for Jordan Cove in Southern Oregon that you couldn't just flip the permit, is that there are different impacts when you're talking about export versus import. Um, if you're coming in, you're bringing in ballast water. And tankers full of ballast water have all sorts of contaminants. Um, and that's how things like zebra mussels get introduced into waterways. Um, so there's a lot of concern. Often the temperature of that water is significantly higher um, than the background temperature. And, and as I think most folks know, the, the Columbia is an impaired waterway in their, uh, Oregon and Washington, and the federal government has spent millions and millions, billions of dollars really trying to restore it as a healthy um, habitat for salmon and as a destination for recreationists and commercial and recreational fisher folk. And this is just a huge threat to um, that progress. Um, so, and it's interesting because the Columbia is also, um, there's a whole lot of folks that would like to, industry, that would like to turn the Columbia into a, a giant coal chute now too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're seeing not just the liquefied natural gas proposals, but also proposals to export over 150 million tons of coal through the Northwest. Um, so there's a lot of, really, right now the Pacific Northwest is ground zero around fossil fuel exports. And there's even talk about tar sands, um, a la the Kingstone pipeline through Washington state. So. 
Hmm. Uh, it's just an incredibly important time for people to just speak up and say, this makes no sense for our local environment. It is catastrophic in terms of climate impacts. Um, it's threatening to the region's reputation as a sustainability leader. Um, and it also has just terrible consequences for the folks in the extraction areas, mm -hmm. um, whether it be coal mining in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming and Montana or fracking in Colorado and Wyoming and the East Coast or in Al tar sands in Alberta. Um, and if you look at the amount of fracking that occurs right now that's creating this supposed glut in the market, there's not enough demand to really call for a lot more fracking. So our organized efforts to ban fracking nationally um, will really be bolstered if we manage to stop um, exporting this because if we start exporting it and create even more demand for it, it'll mm -hmm. be a, a tougher fight to get, get a ban on fracking. So that's one of the reasons why Food and Water Watch is focusing on LNG exports in Oregon is because we know this is a crucial point in, in, in the fight to ban fracking. Mm -hmm. right. okay. is, is there any f uh, federal agency or are there any requirements that all of these kinds of export um, uh, activities, both for coal and for LNG and uh, otherwise, be reviewed all as a single project? or? There's or not at all, unfortunately, and there's actually no federal regulation um, for coal to export at all. Um, there is some regulation around natural gas, um, and that agency is FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and right now they're in a process of collecting comments for scoping, and um, by the time the program airs, they'll be a little past that, um, the deadline, but um, there'll be multiple opportunities in the next couple of years for the, for the community, for the public to weigh in on these proposals, but um, luckily for LNG, this, both the state governments of Oregon and Washington and local county governments have authority to stop these projects, and so it's exceptionally important that uh, people make their opinion heard about those projects and that talk in Oregon to Governor Kitzhaber and to Governor-elect um, Inslee in Washington State or Peter Goldmark, the Commissioner of State Lands in Washington. In Oregon, you can actually call Governor Kitzhaber um, has somewhat of a unique thing, especially in this day and age um, with budget cuts. He has a citizens representation line. And on Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, there's actually a person that answers that phone. Um, so that citizens can call and tell them their opinion about liquid financial gas or coal export and ask that Governor Kitzhaber stand up for Oregonians and for public health and the environment. Um, and deny any permits that would allow these really catastrophic projects to go through the state. And that phone number, I think you put it up on the screen, yeah, but we'll it's 503-378-4582. Okay. Uh, so that's a really great way that folks can weigh in anytime. Um, and then uh, one of the lead local organization that works on both coal and LNG is, is Columbia Riverkeeper, which is part of the Waterkeeper Alliance, um, an international and national group. And Columbia Riverkeeper's website has an really wonderful tools that are specific to these projects along the Columbia specifically. Um, and then in Southern Oregon, some of the lead organizations, there's information on Flo's website, uh, uh, which is OregonWaters.org. And then also Klamath Siskiy Wildland Center and Rogue Riverkeeper are, are leaders in the fight and Coos Waterkeeper. Um, so there's one thing that's really heartening is that um, organizations large and small, so national and international like the organizations that Julie and I work for and small and totally grassroots like Flow uh, have come together to work um, to get uh, really to combine forces and um, strategically to, to really prevent these pr these real threats to right. um, to our communities and and to the global climate. It's um, in Late January, Greenpeace will be putting out a report about the 10 largest threats um, to the climate uh, globally. And the coal export proposals specifically from the Pacific Northwest are the fourth largest threat to climate stability in the world, um, which is sort of hard to comprehend. So. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. And, and, and I, I was very encouraged because uh, very recently mm. there was a DEQ hearing yep. on, on coal. Yes. And just talk about that hearing a little bit. And what sure. Happened. So DEQ, um, the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, which um, oversees uh, implementation of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, um, stormwater provisions in, in Oregon, decided to hold some public meetings to really hear from the public about their concerns about the first 
coal export proposals. So there's currently five proposals moving forward in Oregon and Washington. Um, all of them would come through the gorge. So the gorge is really, um, really a, tar a target right now for yeah. the mm -hmm. coal industry. Um, so DEQ did this really great thing, and they held three hearings or public meetings this week, one in Boardman, one in Clatskanai, and one in Portland um, in mid-December um, to really hear from the public. And um, in Portland, um, there were over 800 people, um, which is the largest public meeting that DEQ has ever held. Um, and the overwhelming majority of those folks spoke out, spoke out in real opposition and concern. Um, and it was a really interesting mixture of people from public health advocates, nurses, and doctors um, who were really concerned about asthma and diesel um, and the toxins that are in coal like, uh, like lead and arsenic and mercury. Um, and then orchardists and recreationists in the gorge, um, folks really concerned about the climate impacts. Um, and it's a really interesting situation because this country is moving away from the use of fossil fuels. We've, it's sort of like what happened after Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. There was a huge amount of attack on her, and then slowly people realized actually she, this thing, about. right? This <laughs> thing that we thought was a miracle product is actually undermining our entire food chain um, and <coughs> sort of the web of life. And and that's what's happening with coal. It seemed like oh, this these cheap black rocks are great. They, um, you know, they provide cheap energy, <coughs> and it turns out that the public health and environmental costs of that are just far too high. And Oregon's chosen to, ch to shut down our only coal-fired power plant, um, and that'll be offline by 2020, and, and the same in Washington. And so really quite soon, this region is going to be totally coal-free. So the idea that we would bring these other fossil fuels through this region uh, is pretty anathema to that progress that we've made. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, very good. We're going to turn to Julie, Julia for a moment here and talk about Nestle mm -hmm. uh, and talk about their plans to build a, a bottled water plant in Cascade Locks. And just a quick update because unfortunately we only have a few, few more minutes left. Okay. So uh, just the, the quick and dirty version of this is that Nestle is a um, huge multinational corporation uh, that uh, is one of the leaders in the bottled water industry. And Food and Water Watch fights bottled water because we really believe that water is, because we know that water is a human right, um, it's necessary for life, and that we uh, can't allow corporations to uh, make it into a commodity so that they can profit off of it. That's just not part of um, uh, a, you know, a sustainable future for water for all people and, and life on Earth. So we oppose all bottled water on principle. It is, uh, you know, the plastic is an issue and there's all these other issues and we work on it for those reasons as well, but ultimately it's a right to water issue. Um, and in Oregon, they want to open up their first Northwest bottle, wa water bottling facility in the town of Cascade Locks, which is between Portland and Hood River on the Columbia River. Um, they want to bottle spring water that snow melt from Mount Hood um, is what they're going to profit off of and uh, they actually charge more for spring water um, and they uh, market it as their Arrowhead brand um, and they would also bottle uh, the town's municipal water as well under the Nestle Pure Life brand. Um, basically we have succeeded in stopping them from opening up shop. Uh, they wanted to break ground by 2010. As of now they don't even have access to the spring water they wish to bottle. Um, the reason is because uh, the state agency that uses that spring water is the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. They use it for fish hatchery. Um, and Nestle is trying to get that uh, uh, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to do a water exchange in which they would give some of their water to the town of Cascade Locks. The town would then sell it to Nestle for fractions of a penny per gallon. And then the town would replace the water it was given with its own groundwater. It's this very complicated water exchange process, but the, the, at the end of the day, there are two state agencies that have to they make that happen. The Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife applies for this water exchange application, and the Oregon Water Resources Department is the department that approves or denies that application. We're about three years out, literally, from a final decision on that water exchange. Um, for the past three years and for the next three years, we, are, we, we have our, basically our goal is to get uh, the governor to tell his state agencies not to move forward with the water exchange um, because it sets a dangerous precedent of a lot, you know, we, we talked about how we're supposed to be a state that's known for its sustainability and we're going to be the first state that has a state agency giving away publicly owned water so that Nestle can profit and profit off of it. I mean, that's, 
criminals. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is February 8th, uh, the Commission for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is meeting and uh, we're hoping to be on the agenda, which means they officially have to hear from the public on this issue. We don't know yet uh, as of the time of the airing of this show, we might, but uh, uh, no matter what, on the 8th, we're showing up to the commission meeting in February um, to make sure that they hear from the public on this issue because ultimately the commission can also tell the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to pull out of this water exchange process and protect Oregon's water from, from Nestle. Okay, so uh, w people who might want to go to that, where do they go to find out you know, where it's going to be and what time and all those It will be in days. Salem. Um, we don't know what time yet, so it will be um, posted on our blog, which is keepnestleout.wordpress.com. If you just you know Google Keep Nestle Out, you can find it really easily. Okay. We also have a Facebook page where we announce our events, which is also Keep Nestle Out of the Gorge. Um, on Facebook. Uh, so if you look those things up, okay. we'll, we'll keep you posted. All right. Excellent. Very good. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, thank All you. Right. Thank you, Bethany. Thanks very much for yeah. having us. And folks, if they're interested about coal, should look at powerpasscoal.org, which is oh. the coalition's website. Okay. Powerpasscoal.org. Okay. Yep. Wonderful. Okay. So we've been talking with uh, Bethany Cotton with uh, Greenpeace USA. She's a board member of FLOW. Uh, and uh, with Julia DeGraw, who is a uh, Northwest organizer with Food and Water Watch. And uh, in terms of future actions here in, in Portland that you might be interested in, the Alliance for Democracy has been instrumental in forming an alliance or a coalition to support passage by the Oregon State Legislature during the upcoming uh, 2013 session of a joint memorial similar to that which we hope the Multnomah County Commission will, will pass. Uh, calling for amending the U.S. Constitution to eliminate corporate personhood as well as money as speech. And so the, uh, co the coalition members are the Alliance for Democracy, all of the Move to Amend affiliates here in Oregon, the Rural Organizing Project, uh, and the Oreg oh, Oregon Main Street Alliance and Oregon Common Cause. Your help is needed in visits to Oregon representatives and senators uh, where you live. And if you want to help us out, please visit uh, our website at OregonRestoresDemocracy.org to learn more about how to help create this democracy movement. Uh, never miss an episode of the Populist Dialogues again. Uh, we're now on YouTube. Go to YouTube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows in the past year uh, and to subscribe to the series. To learn more about the Alliance for Democracy, go to our national website at theallianceforddemocracy.org or our Portland website at afd-pdx.org. Uh, thanks to our crew today for being here and getting us on the air. So that would be Joan Horton, Dave King, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, Lori Sutton, and Tom Thomas. And thank you, audience, for watching. We hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye.